Toy Story is over 20 years old by now. It is one of the most revolutionary and influential films of the past few decades. So, uh, what is there really to review at this point? All of the essays have been written already. So for this video, we're going to look at it more as a retrospective on the film, in context of the bigger picture. How the original Toy Story fits in with the other two films in the series, and how it has laid the foundation of Pixar's work as a whole. So a quick spoiler warning. In addition to this film, there will be oblique and generalized references to Toy Story 2 and 3. Viewers beware. Alright, so let's get this out of the way. Toy Story is the worst looking Pixar film from a technical standpoint. I'm sorry, but it just is. The human character models are on Canny Valley, the textures are outdated, and just look at that dog. Ew. And yet, despite all of this, I cannot believe that the first feature-length CGI film looks this good. It is unbelievable. You can kind of imagine an alternate universe where the first CGI movie comes out and it looks kind of weird and rough and experimental, like something like Food Fight, and everyone says, oh, that movie? It was okay, considering they didn't know what they were doing yet. But no, we live in a world where the first one of these was frickin' Toy Story. That's pretty cool. Pixar played it really smart in picking out their first feature-length project. Just making the main characters toys gets you halfway there. No one is going to complain about plastic textures if most of the characters are made out of plastic. And while there are humans and animals in the film, they get less of the screen time than our synthetic heroes. And if you're still worried about the Uncanny Valley, why don't you just make one of the major human players a creepy and sinister character like Sid? Toy Story is a film that really lets its character designs do the heavy lifting. Toy Story is also an interesting study as an evolution of Pixar's storytelling. It is a very relationship-driven story. Later Pixar films tend to get a little bigger and more philosophical with its themes. You look at a film like The Incredibles, which examines what it means to be super and how it makes people unhappy. Or something like Inside Out, which analyzes the dichotomy of joy and sadness. Then there's the scope of the movie. Compare Toy Story to Finding Nemo, for example. Both are movies in which the main characters get lost and go on a road trip, but Finding Nemo is a lengthy conga line of new set pieces and quirky characters. Toy Story spends the majority of its times in two households, with a fairly brief visit to Pizza Planet. That's it. Compared to later films, Toy Story is positively quaint. We don't need a ton of characters or anything. We just need Mr. Potato Head to be the voice of cynicism, Slinky Dog the voice of loyalty, Rex, the voice of indecision, and Bo Peep, the token girl. Also Ham, who is just awesome in general. My man. The story stays very compact, very focused, and very intimate. This isn't called Toy Voyage or Toy Wars, it's just a simple toy story. Now that's not to say this film lacks depth, we'll get to that in a moment. But the original Toy Story is content to tell a relationship story, exploring why Woody is so threatened by Buzz. There's a sort of wistfulness that pervades through the three Toy Story films. They all deal with the concept of being wanted, what that means to people, and what it can ultimately do to them. Toy Story starts at the base level of jealousy, how not feeling wanted anymore makes people resentful of others. Toy Story 2 demonstrates how people become disillusioned by this, and questions if immortality is worth the price of human relationships. Toy Story 3 takes this to the extreme, showing how abandonment makes people cynical, self-serving, and in some cases, evil. The concept of simply being wanted and appreciated by others is such a basic human need, something everyone can relate to. The Woody-Buzz relationship can be a substitute for anything you want. Maybe it's an allegory for a sibling rivalry. Maybe Buzz is the new hotshot employee at a company. Maybe Buzz is the super hot girl in high school. Woody basically gives him the stay away from my man speech, after all. Normally, a jealousy plot is tired and predictable. It always ends in a lesson that the other guy is pretty cool and to stop being so darn insecure. And to some degree, Woody does deliver that message. But Toy Story works because it couples it with an identity crisis. The jealousy theme is infinitely more fun when the other person either completely unaware of the rivalry, or is completely uninterested in it. And to make things worse for Woody, Andy isn't an active participant in the drama. It's not like Woody can whine or complain to him about his lack of attention. 
it's only Buzz. And Buzz really couldn't care less. The writers and producers have openly discussed how the script evolved over time and how it portrayed this rivalry. In early drafts, Woody's character was a total sarcastic jerk. You still see remnants of this in Act 1, with Woody pouting constantly and making sinister faces and stuff. You wouldn't see this kind of stuff in Toy Story 2 or 3. But they are careful to keep him on the correct side of the likability line. They very deliberately portray Buzz falling out of the window as being an accident. Woody wanting a night out at Pizza Planet comes off as a crime of weakness, not a cold-blooded murder attempt. It sounds dumb, but that's kind of an important psychological distinction to make. Just in general, it's kind of hard to walk back a character after they deliberately throw someone out a window. I think Toy Story's biggest advantage over its sequels is the fact that they get almost an entire movie of dopey, oblivious Buzz Lightyear. Have you noticed how Pixar keeps trying to bring him back in the second two films? You get glimpses of his old character in Toy Story 2, and then they basically reboot him for parts of Toy Story 3. I mean, I get why they do this. Buzz is a little vanilla as a character once he's woken up. He's just kind of a boy scout. The original Toy Story gets the arrogant doofus the entire time, and then get to capitalize on his mental breakdown. And oh boy, do they. He gets a lot of the best jokes, a lot of the best character moments, and most certainly the most action sequences. While Woody is the main character of Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear is the breakout character. No wonder they keep trying to bring him back. Speaking of Buzz, let's talk about the rules of the Toy Story world. What's cool about these films is that they're super casual in explaining the rules. They name drop that there are rules, but they're not explicitly explained. It's a concept we can all wrap our minds around immediately. They don't feel this need to go through a Christopher Nolan-esque justification of it. Contrast this with the old holiday special, The Christmas Toy, as an example. This is a TV special produced in 1987 by the Jim Henson Company. It shares a lot of elements with Toy Story, such as the toys coming to life or jealousy among them during Christmas time. In that world, we're specifically told that a toy caught in a different position is frozen forever, a much darker and more serious setup. Rugby Tiger, wandering away, is treated like a life or death situation. Toy Story kinda hand waves this issue away, taking the stance that toys try to get as close as possible, and that people won't notice slight changes in positioning. They'll just assume it got moved by someone else, or got lost or something. That being said, it's kinda hilarious that no one ever notices anything in this world. At the end of it, Andy's just like, Hooray, I found these toys, like a gleeful idiot. And he doesn't find their sudden appearance strange. Oh, I must not have looked in this box right next to me. This all falls under suspension of disbelief, obviously. It's just kinda funny how suggestible and easygoing everyone is in these films. Pixar is so uninterested in detailing their rules that they even kind of gloss over the nuts and bolts of how Buzz Lightyear's delusion works. It's probably the most puzzling decision about this film, actually. Buzz Lightyear clearly thinks that he's a real-life space ranger, but is still unable to figure out he's a toy even as he experiences Andy playing with him. They're not unconscious or anything, clearly Buzz knows who Andy is, calling him their chief. But he and Woody never have a discussion about it. Like, hey, how can you be a space ranger when you're freezing up and letting Andy play with you? If Buzz thinks he's a person, then why does he care if Andy sees him moving? Buzz's identity crisis is one of the central plot components, so it strikes me as odd they don't nail this down. All of Woody and Buzz's discussions of this are more open-ended and don't really push this issue. It's not like this issue breaks the film or anything, it can obviously be explained away. Clearly there's something in his programming that follows the rules of the other toys. Maybe from his point of view, everyone else has this weird relationship with their chief, and he just has to follow their rules for now. There's definitely a sort of sixth sense dynamic going on, where Buzz only sees what he wants to see. He does eventually wake up at Sid's house, realizing that he can't actually fly or anything. I would argue that this is probably the weirdest scene in the film, this Randy Newman song right here. Not weird in that it's bad or anything, it's just unusual for how Pixar usually stages its musical moments. It's written and performed almost like a Broadway musical. You can kind of picture Buzz marching around a stage singing this song to the audience. 
It's like a song out of a traditional musical, like Moana or Frozen or something. Pixar almost always sticks to a more third-person approach to their songs, like the super-famous When She Loved Me sequence in Toy Story 2. This song is clearly being sung from Jesse's point of view, but it's staged more like a montage and Jesse isn't acting out the song in real time. The more operatic approach to the song still works, it's just an unusual approach for Pixar. Chalk it up to first installment weirdness, I guess. Buzz's mental breakdown is mostly used as a plot difficulty, but it's cool how it coalesces with Woody's jealousy storyline. Woody's character arc holds the key to getting Buzz out of his funk. And the message isn't just, I admit that Buzz is actually awesome. Buzz is awesome because Andy thinks he's awesome, and Andy is the most important thing in the world. Now, the original Toy Story doesn't really hit me in the feels anymore, but this scene is probably the closest that it gets. It's the old, if you love him, let him go scene, combined with the accepting who you are moral. It serves as a great turnaround scene for the final showdown with Sid. Speaking of which, let's talk about this Sid fellow. When I first saw this film, Sid didn't leave much of an impression on me. He's just the creepy villain of the piece. But over time, I think he's become the character I appreciate most from a writing perspective. He's a fascinating entry in Pixar's history of villains. I like what a distinct counterpoint he is to Andy, while still operating within the same established themes. In a bizarre and twisted way, Sid is kind of a creative kid. He's always making these grand pretend scenarios, creating characters and drama and stuff like that. He's creating worlds with his toys, just like Andy does. He's not a sociopath who emotionlessly destroys things like an animal. Like to Sid, this is his version of play, as horrible and twisted as it may be. It's a theme they revisited in Toy Story 3, this concept of good play versus bad play. At the same time, the film is clear that he is not a nice kid and is someone you want to see get his just desserts. That's the whole purpose that Hannah has in the story. I wonder if, had this movie been produced today, whether Pixar would try to portray Sid as being more misunderstood. Maybe Sid comes from a troubled home, for example. He doesn't know the toys are alive or anything, he's more of an unwitting villain. The plot doesn't necessarily require this character to be a total bastard. I think I prefer the more straightforward characterization of Sid that we ended up getting, but it'll be interesting to see what a more nuanced version of him would look like. Sid's presence in the film does open it up to some rather unsettling and disturbing aspects of the world of Toy Story. It's the utter helplessness of this kind of situation, where the toys are such servants to their owners, they're not supposed to fight back. Like, they're supposed to make their owners happy, and if this is how he gets his jollies? Well, they've served their purpose. Pretty messed up. Makes the existence of these mutilated toys in his bedroom, and their quiet struggle against him, even more grim. You'll notice, they don't allow any of these characters to speak in the film, symbolizing how something has been taken away from them. It makes their ultimate revolution against Sid all the sweeter and more satisfying. The conclusion of the film comes together nicely, of course, bringing a lot of the previous elements together in the end. I especially like how they use RC again, a fun callback to how the whole thing started. And then the thing with the magnifying glass, the retractable wings, and falling with style. I like how they deliberately put that match in Woody's holster, like it's going to be a Chekhov's gun, just to fake us out completely. It's a small, smart little writing detail they threw in. Overall, I think Toy Story is one of those films that's difficult to evaluate objectively. Mostly because of all the influential and emotional baggage associated with it. I can still feel the warm glow of seeing this for the first time and being blown away by how unique it was. There was nothing else like it at the time. But then you run into the issue of how it stacks up against its legacy, films that got to stand on its shoulders. To say that Toy Story sucks because it doesn't look as good as Pixar's other films, or isn't as grand or philosophical, is a little unfair. Of course the film could have done more. Obviously. But it already did so much. I always wonder what much younger people think of the original Toy Story all these years later. People who weren't even born yet when it came out and saw other animated stuff first. Is it just another CGI film to them? 
like they would learn it's an important film, but maybe it just seems like every other movie now, tucked away between their copies of Wreck-It Ralph and How to Train Your Dragon. I don't know. The fact that the first feature-length CGI film could even be considered just like everything else. Well, that's a ridiculously high benchmark in itself. As I alluded to earlier, you can imagine a world where we don't have Toy Story, and the first one is just remembered as an important experiment. Toy Story is a beautiful film because it is fully realized right out the box, proving to everyone, without a doubt, that this animation style has merit. That CGI is an art form in itself that can be used to tell compelling stories with mind-blowing set pieces. It's not just a special effect anymore. It's about characters, humor, and emotion and a whole lot of other stuff. So here's to you, Toy Story, a true pioneer in animation, to infinity and beyond.